Okay. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyiyati a'malina man yahdihillahu falamudillala wa man yudlil falahadiyala wa ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la shirika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شدت سهلا اللهم اجعل عملنا كله صالحا ولوجهك خالصا ولا تجعل لأحد فيه شيئا This is lesson number five in the uh, explanation of the short surahs of the Quran now, this is lesson number five. We're halfway, halfway through there, inshallah. Uh, today, inshallah, by the permission of Allah, we ask Allah for his help and for his support to guide our words. Uh, today, we'll be looking at Surah Al-Duha. Now, the tafsir of Surah Al-Duha from the tafsir, tafsir Al-Si'di, uh, Taysir Karim Al-Rahman, Bi Tafsir Kalam Al-Mannan. Uh, but before we do that, inshallah, we'll look at the study guide for Surah Al-Sharh from the previous week. Uh, question number one, what are some of the meanings of Allah providing sharh for the Prophet Wasallam's chest? What are some of the meanings of Allah, of Allah providing sharh for the Prophet Wasallam's chest? Yeah. Naam, opening his chest to accept the revelation, to giving da'wah, to having good character, to focusing on the hereafter, and also to accepting the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him to those things. And meaning, again, the implication of that is what? Is that even for someone as wonderful and, and as, as great as our Prophet sallallahu that he would not have been able to do what he did without Allah's help. Everybody needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help, and that's the idea. Everyone need Allah, needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help, and that's why any one of the last surahs revealed to the Prophet sallallahu fat. When the help of Allah comes and the victory. Yani the victory came, the conquest of Mecca came after what? After the help of Allah. It came with the help of Allah. And if Allah did not help him, his da'wah would not have moved forward. And so it's important to remember that no matter how much Allah has blessed us with natural goodness that he created us with, how good our character is, how intelligent we are, how financially savvy we are, none of that makes a difference if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not help us. Number two, what is the meaning of wizard? What is wizard? So wizard is huge sins, heavy sins, burdensome sins. And what explanation does Surah Al-Fat, chapter number 48, verse 2, give for the removal of the wizard of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did what for him? Allah forgives those who follow the Messenger. But even the Messenger himself, as Allah mentions in Surah Al-Fat, لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَرَ So that Allah may forgive... Those sins that have already proceeded and any sins that come thereafter. And so Allah removing the wizard of the Prophet ﷺ is for him to forgive him. That he forgave him his previous sins as well as any sins to come. And that is going to be, subhanAllah, in the hadith of Shafa'ah, that is going to be the point by which the Prophet, to let us know how important forgiveness is, that's going to be the point by which the Prophet ﷺ claims or is directed to People seeking shafa'a for him. And you know, when people are standing waiting for the judgment to begin, they're going to go to, the people are going to go to Nuh to intercede with Allah for the judgment to begin. He's going to give his excuse. They're going to go to Ibrahim, alayhi salam. They're going to go to Musa, uh, Musa alayhi salam. They're going to go to Isa, alayhi salam. And when they go to Isa, the hadith mentions, they're not going to mention that he committed any mistake. 
all the other prophets are going to mention what they believe were mistakes that they made that took them away from being able to stand and ask Allah to start the judgment. They're going to go to Isa. And Isa, there's, no, there's not going to be any shortcoming that's mentioned about him. But he's going to say, go to the one whom Allah has forgiven his previous and future sins. Isa is going to direct him to the one who what? Who Allah said he forgave. All of them were forgiven. But the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned specifically about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that he forgave his sins. And that is what is going to allow him to feel yani, the strength and the courage by the permission of Allah to stand in front of Allah and to ask, to request, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to begin the judgment. And so that is the point that Allah's forgiveness yani, is a great is a great thing, and it is what the Prophet ﷺ is distinguished with. Number three, what are two examples that Imam Sa'idi gives for how the dhikr of the Prophet ﷺ was raised? Any, what are instances where the dhikr of the Prophet ﷺ was raised and continues to be raised? Yeah. Allah raised his status so Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala praised Prophet Muhammad. So he praises the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He sends Salat upon him and the angels do as well. Also, we mention in the Adhan that we say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And so his name is raised in that instance as well. Also in the Iqama, also when a person enters into Islam. He cannot enter into Islam without testifying that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah. Number four, what close relationship does Imam Sa'idi explain between the difficulty we experience and the relief that Allah intends for us? What is the relationship between the difficulty and the relief? They come together. Whenever a difficulty comes, it comes with the ease already with it. We just have to what? We have to wait, be patient for that ease to open itself up. The ease comes with the difficulty. There's no difficulty that Allah decrees for us except that there is relief that comes with it. We have to wait to see that relief. And sometimes the relief, sometimes the relief we may not see in the form that we are expecting. Sometimes the relief is the removal of sins that makes worship easier for us. And sometimes we're struggling religiously and we get tested with something. And that test is a purification of sins. And so the relief comes when Allah makes worship easy for us. The things that we found difficulty doing in worshiping Allah, Allah makes those things easy. And that strengthening, that, that improvement of our worship strengthens our heart and helps us to be able to deal with the test that Allah gives us. Now, number five, mention the hadith that Imam al Sa'idi uses to show the relationship between the difficulty we experience and the relief that Allah intends for us. We said that he mentioned the hadith of Ibn Abbas. Where he said at the end of the hadith, وَأَنَّ الفرج مع الكرب, That the relief comes with the calamity. وَأَنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ And that with the difficulty comes the ease. Number six, what does Allah tell the Prophet ﷺ to, or excuse me, how does Allah tell the Prophet ﷺ to show appreciation for the many blessings he has given him? How does he tell him to show his, show his gratitude? That when he's busy with the things he has to do, that he what? That he tire himself out worshiping Allah. You know, the way that a person shows gratitude, the way he commands the Prophet ﷺ to show gratitude is to what? Is to worship Allah. And subhanAllah, that is how the Prophet ﷺ showed his gratitude. When the Prophet ﷺ would get up and pray at night until his feet swole, he was asked, why do you do this and your sins have already been forgiven. Why are you standing up at night till your feet swell, praying, and you already know that your situation is safe with Allah? Why do you do this to yourself? You should be done. Khalas, it's over. You don't have to work anymore. Now you know you're going to Jannah. What did he say? Afala akunu abdan shakura. Shouldn't I be thankful then? And even if, again, you look, we look at the seerahs of, of, the, seerah of the, 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 those who were promised paradise. Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the others. And they didn't stop worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they were given glad tidings of paradise. 
they improved and, 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 and strove to be better. And they didn't like to be praised in their faces. They continued to strive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to show appreciation, what did he do? He continued to worship Allah and strove harder. What does Imam as Sidi mention as the meaning of fansab? He says, فَإِذَا فَرَقْتَ fansab." What does fansab mean? Fansab means to tire yourself out. Allah mentions in Surah Al-Ghashiyah that those who disbelieve, عَمِلَةٌ nasiba. They're going to be working and tired, weary, worn out. Nasab is yani, fatigue. And so, fansab means to stand up and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to tire yourself out worshiping Allah. What is the implied opposite that he says we should stay away from? If we're supposed to busy ourselves worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tire ourselves out worshiping Allah, then what should we stay away from? We should stay away from playing around and wasting our time and those things that keep us away from remembering Allah. We should stay away from playing around, wasting our time, and doing those things that keep us from remembering Allah. And I think it's important, again, to put all of that in context and perspective. Number one, we have to realize that as human beings, we were created to do what? To worship Allah. What does it mean to worship Allah? It means to prefer what Allah wants us to do over what we want to do. That means when Allah tells us to do something, we do it in spite of how we feel. And it's recognizing that because Allah has been good to us, we owe him. Because Allah has been good to us, we owe him. And that's not a foreign concept. When someone is good to us, then we feel indebted to them. When someone is good to us, we feel like we owe them. Allah has been good to us. And so we owe him worship. Our parents are good to us. And so we owe them our obedience. We owe them that we comply with what they say without making it seem like it's a big deal and without complaining about it. And sometimes our parents remind us do you know what I do for you? Don't you know I do this? Don't you know I do that? Then why are you raising your voice? Why are you panicking? I, I'm not asking you to do a whole lot. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't ask us to do a whole lot. That's number one. Number one, we recognize that we have a debt to repay. And again, put that in perspective as it relates to the dunya. If a person has a nice paying job and is comfortable but he has debt. It's very difficult to enjoy a good time and to spend money freely. And you know that you are in debt. And you owe $50,000, $100,000 to an institution. It's very difficult to be comfortable. You have another $50,000 or $100,000 to pay on a house. It's very difficult to have some sense of freedom and some comfort. And you know you have a debt to pay off. And so a person may what? Do overtime, work extra. Why? So I can get this debt paid off and I can relax. We have a debt with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have to pay off. And not only do we have a debt that we have to pay off, we continue to take out on the debt. We continue to ask him. It's not like we stopped at some moment and now we're just working on any what's there. No, we continue to ask him daily. And so we have a debt to pay with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, we can't pay it back. Because he's been too good to us. And even what we paid back is because he gave us the success to pay him back. And you take out a loan and then the bank that you borrow from is giving you money to pay off the loan. That's the idea. Whatever good we do. Allah blessed us to do the good in the first place. And so what? We owe him for helping us to do good and to do what he says. And then if Allah is blessing us to understand that, then we have to be concerned with what level are we trying to reach? Yani, do we want 
the lowest level of Jannah? Or do we want higher levels? Do we want the best? I mean, we're not satisfied in the world with having, having simple things. A simple car may not cost a whole lot, but we want a nice car. Not what gets us by. Not what gets us from point A to point B. We want something nice. And when we eat, and it doesn't take delicious food to fill our bellies and to nourish us. It doesn't have to taste good and, and be wonderful for it to be satiating and for it to be nourishing. But we want the food to taste good and we want to be able to buy nice things. And when we purchase a house, and it, we don't need all types of comfort to lay our head down at night and sleep. But we want something nice. And so that same concept has to go with the hereafter. And it, we want bare minimum for the hereafter because we don't know what the hereafter looks like. We want, the, we want the niceness of the dunya even though we're going to leave it. And we don't know when we're going to leave it. We don't know how long we're going to have it. And a person might buy a car and he has it for a week and then Allah calls him back. Got to drive it for a week. All that work for a week worth of driving. But the hereafter is going to be forever. And these are the realities we have to remind ourselves of. And so we're trying to what? Trying to increase our levels. The Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهُ فَاسْأَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ If you ask Allah, then ask Him for al-firdaus. Don't ask Him for the bare minimum of Jannah. As long as you're dealing with one who is kind and generous in giving, then what? Ask for the best. But it's not enough just to ask for it. You have to what? You have to work for it. Because working for it shows that you really want it. Working shows that you want it. And it's one thing to say, I want this, I want that, I want this. Yeah, I want a really nice car. Okay, work for it, you get it. No, nah, it's okay. Huh? If we want it for those, we got to work for it. And so, what we need to understand is that there's too much that we have to work for to have time to play. It's too much. We have this debt to pay off. We have gratitude to show. And we're trying to raise our levels. Those things keep us what? Busy from having time to play. And when I say having time to play, that doesn't mean that we don't have fun and a good time and don't enjoy ourselves with our family. But we learn to do those things with intent and purpose. We relax because we know we have to get back to work. And the relaxation is to help us in our work. We spend a good time with our children because we want to strengthen that relationship with them so that we can have fluence, influence over their lives and the dunya doesn't. We're hoping that the quality time we spend with our family is what helps us to have a strong relationship with them and then when we encourage them to do good, then they want to do good because they love us and they know that we want good for them. We want to show them a good time. And so we're trying to get close to Allah by being kind to our, our families. We show a good time to our wives because we know that that makes Allah happy. Not just because we're trying to relax. The Prophet said in the hadith of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, وَلَن تُنْفِقْ نَفَقَةً تَبْتَغِي بِهَا وَجْهَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا أُجِرْتَ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى مَا تَجْعَلُ فِي فِي مُرَاتِكَ You will never spend any money. You will never spend any money trying to seek Allah's pleasure except that you will be rewarded for it. Even the food you put in your wife's mouth. So it's about being intentional about what we do. When we play, it's not because we don't have anything else to do. It's not because we're trying to kill time. Don't worry. Something's going to kill time for us. We don't have to kill it. Something's going to kill time. Don't worry. Some, this, Allah has already designated death to do that. We need to be making use of our time in a good way. And that's either by benefiting ourselves or others religiously or benefiting ourselves or others in the deen and in the dunya. And so a person, any, a young man wants to be a husband, wants to be a father, wants to start a family. Do you know the regulations of Islam as it relates to being a husband? 
Do you know the regulations of Islam as it relates to being a father, a parent? Do you have the Islamic knowledge where you're comfortable being able to teach your family? Do you know the ethkar of the morning and the evening by which to seek Allah's help in being able to, to strive for Allah's sake and earn a living? It's too much for us to learn, too much that we need individually and as a community to have time to play. Even when we look at our professions, how are you going to use that to benefit the Muslims? And whatever we learn how to do as a profession, as a job, there should be some way we're thinking about how can I get good deeds with Allah? How can I get close to Allah with what he's blessed me to learn how to do? We should be looking at that. And that should be what we're telling our children. And a person may be studying for his test, for his homework, and he's getting a good deed. Why? Because he's planning on using what he's learning to be able to not ask people. And he's planning to use this to what? To benefit the Muslims. And so doing homework becomes worship because it's being done with an intention. And the time that he uses off to play and to relax can become worship. Why? Because he's using it to relax, to get back to work. But we don't have time just to be playing, just to be scrolling and flipping through social media like that. Trying to see what other people are saying and other people are doing. Other people are living. And we're watching them live and we call that life. People who are really not important. They're really not important. And this actor, this actress, this athlete, you know, at the end of the day, you know, no offense, but usually, usually, these people, they're not the best people. Usually, they're, you know, they're not like the best of society. And what they earn and what they do, they don't use to benefit other people. And so, who are they that we should be worrying about how they live? And you know, what do we know about the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And in the hadith of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he explained to us why it's important to learn about the lives of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. He said, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Mata sa'a, when is the day of judgment going to be? And the Prophet ﷺ said, asked him, Ma the sta'adat talaha, what have you prepared for it? And don't ask me about when it's going to come. When it comes, it's going to come. What have you prepared for it? He said, Ma sta'adat to kabir al-shayh. And I haven't prepared much. Except that I love Allah and His Messenger. You will be with who you love. And Ibn Malik says, We weren't happier on any other day than when we heard the Prophet say, A person will be with whom he loves. And then Anas ibn Malik himself said, and I swear that I love the Prophet Sallallahu and I love Abu Bakr and I love Umar and I ask Allah to place me with them even though my actions don't compare to theirs. He loved the Prophet Sallallahu and he loved Abu Bakr and he loved Umar radiallahu anhum and he hoped that based upon that love that Allah would do what? Raise his levels because the Prophet Sallallahu said a person will be with whom he loves. And so a person has to look at who he loves. And you want to know how we know what we love? It's where we spend our time and our money. It's where we spend our time and our money. Whatever we spend our time doing most, that's what we love. We spend our time on social media a lot because we love ourselves. We love ourselves. We want to see how many likes and comments and feedback that we have from people. No, and we spend our money on things that make people like us because we love ourselves. Or we spend our money on things, tickets to events because those are the things that we love. And so we have to be careful and we have to just make sure that we are using our time. And we have to take ourselves to account. No, we don't have time to waste. We don't have time to play. And when we play, we play with intention. We play because there's a purpose behind that playing and other than that, then we are working to make ourselves better and make the community better and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, and so looking now, inshallah, at Surati al-Duha, 
Uh, the first thing to mention, mashallah, one of the, one of the uh, brothers who attends the class, mashallah, he, he mentioned you know, uh, earlier in the week, and you know, he mentioned, he said, it seems like Surah Sharh and Surah Duha seems like they are related to one another because they both talk about blessings. And there are some of the scholars amongst them, Tawus, who is from the scholars of Yemen, who mentioned, he was from the students of Ibn Abbas, where he mentioned that you know, these two surahs were one surah. That Surah Al-Duha and Surah Al-Shaq were one surah. And it wasn't a prevalent statement, but you know, there was a scholar that said that the two of them were one surah. And again, uh, Tawus was a student of Ibn Abbas, and Ibn Abbas, the Prophet ﷺ prayed for him to teach him the, the meanings of the Qur'an. So it's not, again, it's not a far-fetched statement. And a person that looks at the two surahs see that they are uh, very closely related. Uh, if I were to uh, offer my own uh, input, you know, the relationship between them seems to be very similar to the relationship between Surah uh, Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. You know, they're both ways of seeking refuge, but they're seeking refuge in you know, Surah Al-Falaq. It's about seeking refuge from the harm of the you know, harm in general and harm in the dunya, whereas Surah Al-Nas seems to be focusing more on harm in the deen and protecting one's heart. And so Surah Al-Duha uh, looks at the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is what some of the scholars of Tafsir have mentioned, they look, look at the blessings of Allah before he became a prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before he became a prophet. And then Surah Shah looks at the blessings on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after he became a prophet. Yani Allah opened his chest to receiving more revelation and to improving himself and becoming better in what he is. And he also forgave him his sins. And he raised his mention, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whereas Surah Al-Duha talks about what happened before he became a prophet or when he first became a prophet. Now, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by saying, وَالْضُحَى وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى Imam Al-Si'di, he says, أَقْصَمَ تَعَالَى بِالنَّهَارِ إِذَا انْتَشْرَ ضِيَاؤُهُ He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the day when its light spreads. Yani al-duha is the time when the light, it spreads. Yani it's after the uh, sun has risen, then that time is al-duha all the way until uh, just before uh, salat al-duhur. Now, so he swears by al-duha, and then he says, وَبِاللَّيْلِ And he swears by the night. إِذَا سَجَى He says, وَإِدْ لَهَمَّتْ ظُلْمَتُهُ and, he, and when its darkness becomes extremely dark. Yani, id lahammat dhulmatuhu means that its darkness yani, really sets in. So he swears by the day when its light sets in, and by the darkness when, the, when the, or by the night when its darkness sets in. And as we mentioned previously, the scholars mentioned that there is a connection or Ibn al-Qayyim in particular mentions there's a connection between what's being sworn by and what's being sworn about. Imam al-Si'idi says, he swears by these things, by the daytime and when its light spreads, and by the nighttime and when its darkness spreads, ala i'tina illahi bi rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa He swears by these things regarding the attention and care and concern that he gives for his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he is swearing by the daytime when its light spreads and by the nighttime when its darkness spreads. Uh, about what? About the fact that he has given care and concern and attention to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Bil Munasibah, yani yeah, just, yeah, uh, just to, uh, in, in, in mentioning because the Imam Al-Si'idi doesn't mention this, uh, but also in the Sahih, uh, the reason why this surah was revealed uh, the Prophet ﷺ, you know, there were a few days where he did not receive revelation. And so some of the kuffar, amongst them mentioned in particular was Umm Jamil, who was the wife of Abu Lahab. She came to him and she said, I see that your shaitan has left you. I see that your shaitan has left you. And he's not you're, not, you're not talking about what's been revealed to you for a couple of days. So whatever was coming to you is gone from you now. And so when the Prophet ﷺ heard that, it made him sad. It made him sad. Yani, and some other people from the Quraysh said that, I see that you've made your shaitan angry. 
you've made your shaitan angry. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this surah, what uh, duha, I swear by, the daytime when the light spreads in it, and by the night when it's darkness spreads, that your Lord, ma wadda'aka rabbuk, that your Lord has not left you. Now, and so from the connections that have been made between what's being sworn by and what's being sworn about, uh, some of the scholars have mentioned that what it indicates is that Allah, no matter any, in the dark moments and in the light moments, day and night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you, watching you. He has not left you. Any, whether it's daytime or nighttime, all the time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you, looking after you caring for you, concerned about your situation. Now, and some of the other scholars have mentioned that yani Allah mentions the duha yani, before he mentions the night, showing that the light is coming after the darkness, after the difficult times, after what has made you sad, Allah is going to bring light yani, back to your heart. Whatever darkness or difficulty you're experiencing, that Allah is going to bring light from that. The revelation that has missed you, that dark moment where you were not receiving revelation, there is revelation coming after that that will bring life to, light excuse me, to your heart. So after that dark period, the light, is, the light of, of revelation is coming back to your heart. That's what different scholars have mentioned as the relationship between what's being sworn about and what's being, uh, what's being sworn by and what's being sworn about. Imam al-Si'di, he says, فَقَالَ مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ He says, مَا تَرَكَكَ مُنْذُ اِعْتَنَابِكَ That your Lord has not left you from the moment that He's given attention to you. He says, وَلَا أَهْمَلَكَ مُنْذُ رَبَّكَ وَرَعَكَ And He has not uh, left you, He has not uh, stopped giving attention to you once He has cared for you and looked after you. بَلْ لَمْ يَزَلْ يُرَبِّكَ أَكْمَلَ تَرْبِيَةً أَكْمَلَ تَرْبِيَةً وَيُعْلِيكَ دَرَجَةً بَعْدَ دَرَجَةً He said he has continued to look after you, to care for you, to guide you uh, in the best way, raising your level step after step. He's continued to look after you and to raise your level and to take care of you step after step. Um, again, we mentioned what was the reason why this surah was revealed, and I think it's worth noting that there seem to be there seem to be similarities between this surah and surah al-Fajr, and we'll look at that inshallah a little bit later. But one point worth noting is that when the revelation ceased for a moment, the disbelievers took that as an indication that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has messed up his relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And in Surah Al-Fajr, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions that the way that the kuffar look at life is based upon what happens to them in the dunya. That people, it's natural if people don't know who Allah is, that they judge their relationship with Allah based upon what? What happens in the dunya. And so when times are good, then they say what? My Lord loves me. And when times are difficult, they think that Allah doesn't care about them anymore. And Allah says, Kalla. No, that's not the way it works. It's not that if you're rich and comfortable and wealthy and you got a job and everything is fine and nobody's sick, that Allah loves you. And if you get tested in those things, then that means Allah doesn't love you. No, that's not the way Allah works. Actually, the more Allah loves a person, then the more he what? He tests them to strengthen their hearts. And we ask Allah for al-afiyah. Don't ever ask Allah to test you. You ask Allah to save you from the test. We ask Allah to save us from being tested. Because we don't know how we're going to react. We don't know how we're going to deal with it. But when he tests us, and if he tests us, then we're what? We're patient. And if a person looks at the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that he sees what? That the Prophet ﷺ was tested over and over again in so many different ways. And the Prophet ﷺ was the most beloved person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so being tested in the dunya is not an indication of Allah's love. But if a person doesn't know Allah, then that's how they're going to think that Allah operates. Because that's how? Because how people operate. When we don't know Allah, then we're going to compare Allah to people. And that's a problem. Because people are selfish in that way, 
they give you when they love you and they don't give when they don't love you, then we assume when we don't have revelation that that's how Allah is. It's not how Allah is. Allah gives to those whom he loves and those whom he doesn't love as a test. If Allah, if this dunya meant anything to Allah, the disbeliever would not breathe. If this world meant anything to Allah, the disbeliever would not breathe air. And so the fact that disbelievers are wealthy, are comfortable in this dunya, that they have is an indication that this dunya does not mean much. And as Allah mentions in Surah Al-Fajr, and I advise you to go back and read it, Allah mentions that whatever he gives or he withholds is a what? Is a test. That's all it is. What he gives and what he withholds is a test. That's all it is. And so we don't use what happens in this dunya as a measure of Allah's love. It's not that if we're struggling financially, Allah, does, Allah doesn't love us. And then when we're financially comfortable, Allah loves us. No. In the previous surah, we said what? With the difficulty already comes the ease. It's a test. With the difficulty comes the ease. And sometimes the comfort is really going to be the difficulty because that's what's going to be difficult later on. You know, a person has to work when Allah is good to them to be what? To be grateful. And Allah is always good to us. We have to learn to be appreciative for the goodness because if we're not appreciative, then it's going to be, it's going to be a source of regret. No. And so we don't use the dunya to measure. We don't use the dunya as a measure. But that's how the disbelievers look at things. He says, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى He says, يعني, وَمَا قَلَاكَ وَمَا قَلَاكَ وَمَا قَلَاكَ اللَّهِ يعني, Allah has not قَلَاك Meaning, He has not hated you after loving you. He has not hated you after loving you because, simply because the revelation has ceased. And Ibn Rajab, in his, uh, in his explanation of the 40 hadith, he mentions this surah, and he mentions that that's what qala is. Yani, how is qala, or qali, how is that different from other types of anger? He says that al-qali is al-bugh ba'd al-hub, that it's anger after loving. And yani, you love, and then after that love, then you hate. That's what it means to qala. So he says, and Imam Al-Si'idi is hinting to that, is alluding, alluding to that here in his tafsir. He says, he has not hated you, ma abghadaka mundu ahabbak. He has not hated you since he has loved you. فَإِنَّ نَفْيَ الضِّدْ دَلِيلٌ عَلَى ثَبُوتِ ضِدِّهِ Yani, he says, because negating, negating the opposite or negating something affirms the opposite. Yani when Allah is saying he has not left you, that means that he's with you. And when he says he does not hate you, that means he loves you. Allah is affirming that he loves the Prophet wasallam, and that he's affirming that he's with him, that he's supporting him. How is he affirming that? By negating the opposite. By saying that he hasn't left him and that he, hasn't, that he doesn't hate him is affirming that. He's with him and that he loves him. He says, He says, because negating something is an affirmation of its opposite. He says, simply negating is not praiseworthy. Simply saying, I didn't do something, I, di I don't hate you, or I haven't left you, that doesn't mean much unless we're affirming the opposite. Because in affirming the opposite, any that is where that's what's praiseworthy. So saying that Allah saying that He doesn't hate the Prophet doesn't mean and it's not meaningful unless we're affirming that He loves the Prophet. And that's what He's telling him for. And negating that He's left him is affirming that He loves him. And that's why you find any in the Qur'an, seldom, if at all, does Allah ever say that Allah is just. 
Seldom, if at all, in the Quran does Allah say, Allah is Adil. What does He say? Inna Allah la yadlim. Wa la yadlimu rabbuka ahada. Allah doesn't oppress anyone. Inna Allah la yadlimu mithqala dharra. Allah doesn't oppress even the smallest amount. Why is He negating that He oppresses? To affirm His complete justice. And by negating oppressing at all, that's stronger in affirming his justice. Because if a person is fair, that doesn't mean that sometimes he doesn't slip and become unjust. And a person can be mostly just. 98% of the time he can be just, but then 2% he's unjust. And so when Allah says, Allah does not oppress even a little bit, even the smallest amount, what does that mean? That means Allah is just completely don't even misunderstand that there's a little bit of injustice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything Allah does is fair. How does he affirm his complete fa fairness? By negating any injustice. And so through negation is a more complete affirmation. Through negation is a more complete affirmation. That's why a part of our shahad is what? La ilaha illallah. Nothing deserves to be worshipped except Allah. That's different than saying Allah deserves to be worshipped. Because you could be saying what? Allah deserves to be worshipped and other things deserve to be worshipped. But when you say la ilaha, nothing deserves to be worshipped. Illallah, then that negation makes the affirmation stronger. And so that's the principle that Imam al Sa'di is mentioning here. No, and there's lots more examples that can go with that. But if you take that as a principle for reading the Quran and the Sunnah, whenever you see Allah telling you not to do something, and telling, or the Prophet says, I'm telling you not to do something, then what does that mean? Do the opposite. Allah says, Allah doesn't like love those who deceive. Then what does that mean? That means Allah loves those who are straight up. He loves those who are, who are, who are you know, what you see is what you get. And so when things are negated in the, in the, in, in, in the sharia, in the sharia, then we're affirming the, the opposite. Now, you take that with hadith, take that with ayat. When we're negating something, then the opposite is being affirmed. He says, فَهَادِهِ حَالُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم الْمَاضِيَ وَالْحَاضِرَةِ Yani this is the situation of the Prophet ﷺ in the past and in the present. That Allah was caring for him and looking after him and did not leave him. And now that he's made him a messenger and sent him yani, to mankind, then he also has not left him and is not angry with him. Yani, when a person is غير يعني, mumayyiz, غير aqil, when a person is not able to distinguish and discern and not able to make their own decisions, Allah looks after them. And he, even though they themselves don't have intent. And so if Allah looks after us when we can't do for ourselves, then when we can do for ourselves and we are obedient to him, then wouldn't he look after us more? You know, when we, if he looks after us when we don't do what he says, because we can't, because we're not at the age to do that yet. If he cares for us then, then would he not care for us when we are obedient to him? No. And so he says, فَهَذِهِ هَالُ الرَّسُولِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. This is the, the, the condition of the messenger. الْمَاضِيَ وَالْحَاضِرَ This is the way it was previously, before he became a prophet. And now that he is a prophet, that's the way it is. أَكْمَلُ حَالٍ وَأَتَمُّهَا The most complete and perfect situation. مُحَبُّتُ اللَّهِ لَهُ وَاسْتِمْرَارُهَا وَتَرْقِيَتُهُ فِي دَرَجَاتِ الْكَمَالِ وَدَوَامُ الْإِتِنَاعِ اللَّهِ بِهِ Loved by Allah and continuing, continuing to raise level after level in terms of completeness and Allah constantly looking after him and caring for him. And you look at the Prophet ﷺ at the beginning of his prophethood and you see him grow and develop Later on, yani throughout his prophethood, and you see the prophets that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him 
to become better and to become better and to become more complete and more complete, yet until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself testified that he, that he had completed his message. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم Today I have completed your, <coughs> your religion. وَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And I perfected my favor upon you. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ And I am pleased with Islam as your religion. And this ayat is a praise of who? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala complete the religion? How did he complete the religion? Do the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Who conveyed the Qur'an? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Who taught how to worship? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And so the completion of the deen is a testimony to the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa conveyed the message that he was Abdullahi wa Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued to take care of him until he completed, until he completed in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for him. And Allah never stopped looking after him. And this, and he, to a lesser degree, this is the situation of a believer. This is the situation of a believer. A person enters into Islam. And if he's true in that Islam, Allah continues to look after him and to cause him to grow until he becomes a different human being. And when a person accepted Islam, if a person accepted Islam five years ago, ten years ago, the hope is he can look back and see himself as a better worshiper than he was ten years ago. Yeah, there's still a struggle, but it wasn't like day one. When he first became a Muslim, he didn't know how to, how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. He didn't know how to pray. It was difficult. And someone had to stand with him and teach him. And now, he's praying on his own. And now he's teaching his children and his family. Now maybe brothers and sisters are directing him or her. Here, this brother's going to show you how to pray. This sister's going to show you how to pray. No doubt, that's a better situation. Because now, not only is he benefiting himself, but he's benefiting others. And so the situation of a believer gets what? Better and better. Even with the tests. Because with each test, the person learns what? Better patience. Better trust in Allah. Maybe the first time he didn't handle it well. But the second time, he's patient. Second time, third time, makes dua a little bit more. Fourth time, he's able to shut his mouth and not say anything displeasing to Allah. Not complaining so much. To be able to wait for the relief from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah causes a person, if Allah blesses him to do what? To grow and become better. As mentioned in the hadith of Abi Yahya Suhaib ibn Sinan, a Rumi, where he mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said, عَجِبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٌ وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا لِمُؤْمِنِ Amazing is the situation of a believer. His situation is always good. And that's only for a believer. إِنْ أَصَابَتُهُ الصَّرَّى شَكَرْ فَكَانَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ if good things happen to him, he's thankful, and that's better for him. When asabatu dhara sabr, wadalika khairun lah. And if difficult times afflict him, he's patient, and that's best for him. And so Allah is constantly causing the believer to what? To become better and better, to move higher and higher. And that's the idea. That even a person's Ramadans, you know what a person did in his first Ramadan. Not the same as other Ramadans. And a person becomes a better worshiper with time. And Allah, when a person says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Allah gives that individual certain care. He becomes a different rub for that person. Allah is a rub for everyone as it relates to the dunya. He feeds and clothes and provides for everyone. But for the believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also a rub for his heart. And he blesses him to learn more and to do better and to move. Things that he used to do and not care about. Now when he does them, he feels remorse in his heart. He recognizes that he has disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he wants to be better. And this is a raising of the level of an individual. When he recognizes that his actions should be judged by the Quran and the Sunnah. And that when he goes against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, at least he feels some remorse in his heart. That is a raising of the level. Because the kafir disobeys Allah and feels nothing about it. 
but the believer's heart becomes more and more alive. And if a person is struggling with something, if he continues to pray and ask Allah to guide his heart, then Allah will bless that person to leave, to leave that thing that, that is, that is a challenge for him. Now, until he enters him into his Jannah without any sins and only enjoying the, the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَأَمَّا حَالُهُ الْمُسْتَقْبَلَ As for his future condition, فَقَالَ وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى He says, the hereafter, or what's later, is better for you than what was first. Yani, your later situation is going to be better than your initial situation. He says, I kullu halatin mutaakhiratin min ahwalik. He says, this is not limited to the hereafter. This is for every situation in the Prophet's life. Yani, that every moment of his life, what happens later, what happens next, is going to be better than what happened before. He says, فَإِنَّ لَهَا الْفَضُلْ عَلَى الْحَالَ السَّابِقَةِ الْحَالَةِ السَّابِقَةِ Every situation from the Prophet ﷺ is only going to get better. Every situation of the Prophet ﷺ is only going to get better. He says, فَلَمْ يَزَلْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يَصْعَدْ فِي دَرَجَاتِ الْمَعَالِي He said he continued to move into higher levels. وَيُمَكِّنُ اللَّهُ لَهُ دِينَهُ And Allah continued to give his, his religion more firmness. وَيَنْصُرُهُ عَلَىٰ أَعْدَاهِهِ And that he, yani he strengthened him against his enemies. وَيُسَدِّدُهُ And he reassured him and reaffirmed him. فِي أَحْوَالِهِ In his situations. حَتَّى مَاتَ Until he died. وَقَدْ وَصَلَ إِلَىٰ حَالٍ مَا وَصَلَ إِلَيْهَا الْأَوَّلُونَ وَالْآخِرُونَ He said until he continued, until he reached a level that those before him and those after him can never reach. من الفضائل, from his virtues, ومن النعم, and from his blessings, وقرت عين, and from happiness and joy, وسرور القلب, and happiness of heart and peace of mind. Yani the Prophet ﷺ, in all of his situations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made him better. He's made him better than all the other prophets, alayhim salam, because he allowed his revelation to what? To last. Allah has preserved his book. No other book has been preserved. And he has allowed his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa to be preserved. That we know with certainty what the Prophet ﷺ did in every situation of his life. And that we have the ability to what? To learn that. We have the ability to know exactly how the Prophet ﷺ worshipped. And that's another reason why we don't have time. Why we don't have time to waste and play. Because there's too many situations that we're dealing with off the cuff. Too many situations that we're dealing with and we don't know what to do in those situations. And we need to learn. You need to give an example, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that he mentions that when a person eats food and after he eats food, if he says Alhamdulillah alladhi at'amani hadha wa razaqanihi min ghayri hawlin minni wa la quwa All praise to the one who fed me this and provided it for me without any strength or power of my own if he says that after he eats he gets his sins forgiven. If you didn't know that hadith, that means we don't have time to play. And how many good deeds, how much forgiveness are we losing out on because of what we don't know? And we're not making time to know. And the same hadith has been mentioned for putting on clothes. If a person puts on an article of clothing and he says, Alhamdulillah alladhi kasani hadha وَرَزَقَنِيهِ مِنْ غَيْرِ حَوْلٍ مِنِّي وَلَا قُوَّةٍ All praise to the one who clothed me in this and provided it for me without any strength of my own or any power, then he gets his previous sins forgiven. A person puts on his pants and says something that gets his sins forgiven, and his shirt and says something and gets his sins forgiven, and his jacket and says something to get his sins forgiven, and his hat 
and says something to get his sins forgiven. He didn't say once he gets dressed. He said if he puts on his clothing. And each of these is its own article of clothing. And if we're looking at why would a person be forgiven for something like that, Allah forgives and blesses those who praise him. Because if a person praises Allah for what he gets, then that shows that he's what? Grateful. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ibrahim, And when your Lord proclaimed, if you're grateful, I will do what? I will increase you. And a person says, Alhamdulillah, in Surah Al-Fatiha, and if he left his home and came to the masjid, and the imam's, imam says, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَضَّالِينَ If the person behind the imam in the masjid, this is a fadila for the masjid. If a person behind the imam says, Amin to what? To Alhamdulillah, what's going to happen? His previous sins get forgiven. And also in the masjid, when the imam raises up and says, Semi Allahu liman hamida, if those behind him say, Rabbana wa lakal hamd, O Allah, and to you, O our Lord, and to you is the praise, what happens? He gets his previous sins forgiven. This is in Sahih Bukhari. This is why we don't have time to play. You know, how many opportunities are we losing? On getting our sins forgiven. On getting our sins forgiven. Because we just don't know. And no one's going to get to Jannah unless his sins are forgiven. And everybody sins. Everybody falls short. You know why? Because we're not grateful enough for Allah's blessings. That's, that's the sin. The sin is, the oppression of ourselves, is that we are not thankful for the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can't be, because we don't, because we don't know them all. Because we don't know all the ways that Allah has blessed us. And because the blessings of Allah are too many to count, then we can't appreciate them. Yani appreciate, show gratitude to Allah for every breath that we take. If you said, Alhamdulillah, every time you took a breath, then you couldn't do anything else. If we said thank you to Allah, Alhamdulillah, every time our heart beats, then we couldn't do anything else. Which is why when we leave the bathroom, we say what? Gufranak. Why are you seeking forgiveness for leaving the bathroom? Is it because leaving the ba using the bathroom is a sin? No. Because we thank, can't thank Allah enough for his blessings. The blessing of being able to get that poison out of your body. And being able to chew it. And being able to swallow it. And for your body to be able to digest that food and then get rid of it. All those are different blessings that need to be what? Appreciated. Don't you as a parent? Don't you as a friend? Don't you as a teacher? Don't you as an employee? You get paid to work. But you want to be? Appreciate it. Allahu Akbar. Money isn't enough. Money isn't enough. We get paid to work, but we want to be what? Appreciate it. Recognize that I did a good job. Because everybody doesn't do a good job. No. Allah could have left us to anyone to take care of us, but He didn't. He took care of us Himself. Not only in our dunya, but in our deen. He made sure that a man, that a man, that men would go hungry and leave their homes and struggle and be fought against. Why? To make sure that you and I got revelation. He made sure that people would have the heart to sacrifice for this deen. Why? So that you and I now could worship in comfort. The Prophet said some of his companions didn't pray in masajid like this. They didn't have air conditioning and heaters. And they didn't eat nice meals all the time, most of the time. Why did they suffer like that? Allah gave them heart to do what? To transmit the deen. And that's what we got to have. And we got to look at that and be inspired. We got to have heart 
to pass this dean on. We got to have heart to work so that our children who come after us have yani, what they need to be able to keep pushing. And so the point is what? Who did that for us? Allah. Allah put it in people's hearts like that. Imam al-Bukhari. He put it in Imam al-Bukhari's heart to what? To not just travel the land and take vacations. To sit down and write hadith after hadith after hadith after hadith to travel here and travel here to study. Why? So that we can have Sahih Bukhari sitting on a bookshelf looking at it. Yeah. That's the reality. And so we have to be appreciative. And so we owe gratitude. And it's too much for us to what? It's too much for us to show. And so we need what? Allah's forgiveness. We need Allah's forgiveness. And subhanAllah, and perhaps we'll, yeah, let, let's, let's end on this point. Yeah, we'll, we'll pick up where we left off. I'm not in a rush. Don't need to be in a rush, huh? In Sahih Muslim, and this is, this is important for da'wah and it's important for us to understand. Because a lot of times, disbelievers, kufar, they say they, 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 they don't understand. They don't understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could punish people when they're nice. They don't understand how Allah can punish people when they're nice people. Aisha asked the Prophet sallam, about one of her ancestors. His name was one of her forefathers. His name was Ibn Jud'an. She said, Ya Rasulullah, Ibn Jud'an, he used to feed the poor and he used to keep good family ties. هَلْ يَنْفَعُهُ ذَلِكَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Will that benefit him on the day of judgment? The Prophet ﷺ said, لا. No. إِنَّهُ لَمْ يَقُلْ يَوْمًا مِنَ الدَّهَرِ He never said a day in his life, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي خَطِيَةِ يَوْمَ الدِّينِ He never said a day in his life, My Lord, forgive me my sins on the day of judgment. No matter how nice you are, you have not fulfilled Allah's right. That's the idea. Allah has rights that deserve to be fulfilled. And whoever strives to fulfill those rights, Allah will do what? Forgive them and let them go. And whoever does not even acknowledge the right. Yani when a person says, La ilaha illallah, what did he do? Why does he deserve saying La ilaha illallah? Why does he deserve Jannah for that? Because he acknowledged Allah has rights even if he falls short in fulfilling them. The kafir, the disbeliever doesn't acknowledge. He doesn't say Allah, I recognize you have rights. I'm falling short in fulfilling them. He doesn't acknowledge Allah has a right at all. And so because of that, he deserves to be punished. We deserve to be punished too. Because even though we acknowledge the right, we didn't fulfill it. But because we try to fulfill it, that Allah does what? Let's us go. And this explains for us the first hadith in Kitab al-Tawheed, the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, where he was riding behind the Prophet one day, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Mu'adh, do you know the right of Allah on his slaves and the right of the slaves on Allah? He said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. He said, Allah and his messenger know best. And this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. He says, the right of Allah on the slaves, an ya'buduhu wa la yushriku bihi shay'an, is to worship him and not commit shirk. That is Allah's what? His right. وَحَقُّ الْعِبَادِ عَلَى اللَّهِ And the right of the slave on Allah أَن لَا يُعَذِّبَ مَن لَا يُشْرِكْ بِهِ شَيْئًا The right of the slave on Allah is that Allah not punish him if he does not commit shirk. The right of the slave is what? To not be punished if he does not commit shirk. Meaning, if he does commit shirk, if he does not make the acknowledgement that Allah has rights that distinguish him from the creation, he deserves what? To be punished. 
Then the Prophet said, sorry, then Mu'adh said, Ya Rasulullah, afla ubashiru nas, should I not give glad tidings to the people? That they have this right on Allah, that Allah, they have the right that Allah not punish them if they fulfill this right. He said, La tu bashir hum fa yet takilu. Don't give them the glad tidings. Because they're going to do what? They're going to depend on the promise and they're not going to do any work. They're going to depend on the promise and not do any work. And when they don't do the work, then they're not going to do what? They're not going to fulfill the right to the best of their ability. And so that's the idea. That's the idea. Allah has rights. And la ilaha illallah is about fulfilling the right of Allah. And everybody falls short in fulfilling that right. But the person who says la ilaha illallah and prays is what? Is acknowledging the right. And is making the minimal effort to fulfill the right. The person who never says la ilaha illallah is not what? Is not acknowledging that Allah has a right. And because Allah's right is so great, then the punishment is severe. Because Allah's right is so great, the punishment is severe. Federal crimes are different than state crimes, right? It's a different, different level, right? Why? Because a crime against the state is against yani, a small entity. A federal crime is against the, 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 the entire government. They're different levels. And so they have different what? Sentencing standards. And so Allah, this is beyond federal. This is another level. And so don't try to imagine, just like you can't imagine the greatness of Allah's qualities, then we also cannot imagine the greatness of his rights. And because of that, then we have to recognize that we fall short in recognizing the greatness of his punishment and also the greatness of his reward. No. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to strive to fulfill his rights and that he bless us to be better all the time. And that's from the dua of the Prophet sallallahu where he used to say, Nam. The dua of the Prophet is something that he used to say, and this is a dua for any time. Allahumma aslih li dini alladhi huwa ismatu amri. O Allah, rectify my deen, which is what keeps my life together. Wa aslih li dunyaya. O Allah, rectify my dunya. Alati fiha ma'ashi, which is what, yani, it's where I have to live. Wa aslih li akhirati, and rectify my hereafter. Alati ilayha ma'adi, which is where I have to return. Wa ja'al al hayata ziyadat li fi khuli khair. Make each day an increase for me in goodness. Help me to continue to improve. And make death the end of all evil. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make each day for us as believers an increase in goodness and that he make death whenever it comes for us. May he make it a relief to any evil. Subhanahu wa bihamdik. Ashadun la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruk wa tubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.